le preguntamos a nuestro próximo invitado, ¿cómo pueden las naciones promover el surgimiento y el establecimiento de una innovación sostenible para el desarrollo de un país? Y nos respondió, la innovación de la era digital tiene lugar en los ecosistemas y dependen de un buen liderazgo. Una respuesta clara de un hombre que llegó a ser el primer ministro más joven de Finlandia con tan solo 36 años. Esco Ajo no solo tiene este récord, sino que tuvo la responsabilidad de gestionar su país durante la recesión que enfrentó en los 90, implementando fuertes reformas y logrando la incorporación de Finlandia a la Unión Europea. Dejo con ustedes al ex primer ministro de Finlandia, señor Esko Ajo. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, uh, having an opportunity to, to join your conference. Unfortunately, I was not able to, to physically visit Chile. I have never been in your beautiful country. Maybe sometimes in the future, uh, that kind of option or opportunity will, will uh, occur. But anyway, here I am and, and I'm trying to, to explain to you what kind of role science, technology and innovation are able to, to play when trying to create economic growth, well-being and prosperity, not only in countries, but in companies and business entities as, as well. I'm going to start by referring to Malcolm Gladwell, a famous uh, American writer. Uh, in his book, Outliers, Gladwell uh, gave five criteria for success stories or successful performances uh, by countries, companies, even individuals. According to his list, number one is uh, access to revolutionary technologies. Technology is the foundation of uh, success stories in, uh, uh, in the modern era. If you look at what happened in the UK in the 19th century, in the United States, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, or in Japan and China, uh, late uh, 20th century and early this century, I think you can, you can easily understand how crucial access to technologies, uh, a high level revolutionary technologies actually is. Secondly, you need skills and talents. It's not a surprise that, uh, a poor coincidence, that, that uh, industrialization and modern educational system were developed together. Railway systems in the United States, which were uh, expanding very fast uh, in the middle of the 19th century, they needed qualified, qualified people, people with uh, good skills and talents. And uh, schools, elementary schools, vocational schools were needed in order to, to meet that challenge. So education has been part of modernization in every corner of the world. And it's a fundamental success factor as well. For the third, you have to take risks. Capacity to, to take risks is very critical for, for innovative economies innovative societies. Uh, when uh, looking at innovation uh, and analyzing what is the core of innovation, uh, you have to look at uh, a couple of good explanations. I, I found one very interesting one in the Harvard Business Review uh, a few years ago. The writer of the article asked, what is the opposite of innovation? And uh, his uh, answer was quite interesting. He said, it's imitation. And imitation is uh, a, a good method to grow and to get rapidly results with low risk. Because when you are imitating, you are taking into, you, into the use solutions that have been tested already. 
and uh, imitation is low risk low return method to be developed and useful for many countries and companies as such but if you want to make a great success story you have to make and take extraordinary risks high return can be achieved only by taking higher risks that's why innovation quite often requires requires major risk taking capacity banking sector is uh, very good in funding traditional businesses but we need extraordinary efforts in the field of uh, innovative sectors venture capital venture capital investments are urgently needed the fourth uh, element on the gladwell's list was uh, uh, ecosystem requirement in order to get uh, benefits from technologies you need to have the right kind of ecosystem especially digital technologies require qualified very developed ecosystem in order to to get uh, uh, good results i will explain that more in a more detailed way a bit later and finally uh, timing is important sometimes companies are doing things too early they are getting to the market products and services which are so creative or so innovative that consumers are not yet ready to take them into the use we have seen that kind of cases several times uh, and uh, this type of companies can fail but sometimes and more often companies and countries are too late coming too late they are not able to get huge benefits from uh, from uh, uh, creative solutions because somebody else has been faster than them i will go in a more detailed way now uh, what uh, countries like finland or chile can do in order to meet better these five criteria of success how can you improve your performance as a country in these five areas i will start with uh, timing i think timing to make radical changes is perfect timing for reforms is perfect because uh, the crisis not only this pandemia but also financial crisis both of them have had major impact in economies and societies and uh, we have to understand that we are moving to a new normal those criteria we had for economic and social development earlier are not valid anymore we have to be able to to create new ones instead of them that's why when we are trying to fight against uh, these challenges or meet these challenges in front of us today we have to understand that they require radical changes in our thinking our operational capacities as as well as far as technology is concerned that is the second second item on the agenda you have to understand that there are two ways to to be leading in the field of technology one competition takes place in verticals in today's world artificial intelligence or uh, or uh, bioeconomy development or uh, healthcare sector uh, development are good examples of areas where billions and billions are needed and required in order to get uh, uh, high quality uh, uh, achievements to be honest that is a game where big countries and big companies do have uh, assets artificial intelligence is a good example of that you cannot imagine that country like finland or chile can be 
extremely competitive in these areas. We have to accept the fact that, that it is a game where size matters and uh, smaller countries, smaller companies do not have capacities urgently needed in these areas. We have to be active there. We have to be able to follow what's going on there. We have to understand what is going to happen in these verticals, but it's not our game. Another game is horizontal. How to integrate new technologies into everything what we do. And that is horizontal game. And sometimes small is beautiful in this uh, horizontal game. If you are a small one, you are much more flexible. Your capacity to integrate complicated new things together is much better than in bigger entities. I will take a couple of examples. For example, healthcare sector applications. Medical development or creation of new pharmaceuticals is a game where big companies are dominant. But when you are starting to, to use these technologies locally, the size doesn't matter that much. It's much more relevant to be flexible, able to, to, to work with uh, ordinary citizens, customers and clients in an in a, in a efficient way. The same with, uh, with uh, transportation and logistics, which is very important for Finland, but also for Chile. We are similar kind of countries with long distances. The logistics is extremely important for both countries. Uh, certain technologies developed in verticals are not available for, or we are not very strong in those, but we can take benefit from those technologies when applying them. And uh, uh, opportunities there are huge. How to guarantee that we have enough uh, access or, or good access to these verticals and in the same time these horizontal capacities. I think we need two things. For the first, R&D spending. Uh, R&D spending played a big role in Finland when we started modernization of our country. In 1980, Finland spent 1% of GDP in R&D. That was less than the OECD average. We made a strategic decision that within one decade until 1990, we, we have to double that investment to move from 1% of GDP to the level of 2%. In spite of the fact that we have different kind of coalitions, political coalitions, all the governments were committed to this. And year 1990, Finland reached the level of 2%. If you asked Finns 1990, what was the result of that investment? Very few were able to answer or to give good answers. We didn't see yet benefits from those investments. But a few years later, 1995, or especially year 2000, if you ask the same question, people were ready to say, that investment we made in R&D has been the best investment ever made in this country. Because uh, development of Nokia, the whole ICT cluster and uh, globalization of our companies that was based on ICT, well, that was based on R&D investment made uh, since the beginning of 1980s. And that was a joint effort by government and uh, companies. Both were needed. Private money and governmental money were needed, and they were combined in our projects. But secondly, we integrated third element of uh, Gladwell's list, educational investment into, the, into that picture. So when R&D spending was expanded and increased, we simultaneously increased investments in education. And we made it possible that companies and universities, technological high schools or the technological uh, universities, all the, the, uh, those were able to collaborate with businesses much, much better than before. 
So we were able to transfer academic and research institutes work into business uh, in an in a efficient way, which made it possible that companies were able to create new kind of competitiveness in the global arena. And, uh, and uh, the best example of that was Nokia's success story in the 1990s. And I think, again, today, the critical thing when looking at two technological areas where both Finland and Chile do have a huge potential, both of them require roughly the same kind of method we have used in the, 19, in the 1980s and 1990s. And those two sectors are digitalization and uh, expansion of bioeconomy. Digitalization requires a lot of technological tools. But in the same time, we have to be able to educate people to use this in an efficient way. And uh, the critical thing is not to have more and more specialists. But the critical thing is to get people who are able to integrate existing businesses, existing ways of doing products and services with new technologies. I would like to call that uh, uh, creation of uh, multidisciplinary talents. People who have a capacity to understand not only technological aspects, but business aspects, uh, cultural aspects, human aspects of technologies in order to get the right kind of solutions to, to, to be available. That is the major challenge of horizontalization, how to have high quality multidisciplinary talents. The same with the bio sector. I know that uh, Chile has uh, substantial uh, forests, uh, for, forests and, and uh, that resource can be used in the future not only for traditional paper and pulp and, uh, and uh, wood products, but it's, uh, it's a raw material for chemical industry, material technologies, uh, almost for everything what we, what we need. And, uh, and the key criteria, how to get benefit from, from, from forests and, and uh, traditional uh, forestry, is to, to have this type of multidisciplinary talents, capacities to integrate environmental knowledge, technological capacities, but also cultural aspects into, into these businesses. Then a few words about, uh, uh, about risk-taking capacity. Uh, I already mentioned that, uh, that we urgently need uh, new type of uh, funding methods as well. Banking sector is able to provide funding when uh, traditional uh, industrial investments are made. But uh, when, when doing investments in uh, new technologies, especially in innovative new uh, te technologies, uh, we have to have higher risk acceptance and sometimes risk is so high that everything will be lost typical venture fund is happy to have uh, less than 10 successful cases out of 100 those less than 10 cases have that kind of potential that they can cover costs of uh, 90 failed cases this traditional banking sector system doesn't doesn't uh, uh, fit with this type of market. That's why if you want, and when we want to have more and more startup companies, uh, innovative small companies to come to the market, we have to create funding system for that. Governments cannot play that role. Governments can give some support for venture funding. Maybe taxation will be a good method to do that. But the fundamental is that that money is coming from the private sector and uh, if and when angel is investors are available that is 
probably the best way to create good, well-functioning venture funding. I know that in Chile you have traditional sector businesses. I hope that you will encourage them to move partly into new areas and to use venture funding vehicles to do that. Uh, I think this is one way to promote transformation of your economy in a positive, positive way. Then uh, a few words about ecosystem. What to do with uh, ecosystem? Uh, there are many criteria. What kind of things uh, well-functioning innovation ecosystem requires? Easy to understand that it requires good infrastructure. Not only roads and railroads or airports and harbors, but uh, more and more digital infrastructure. 5G is going to play a big role in economic and social development in the, in the future. If you don't have this infrastructure available, it's very difficult to take into the use modern digital solutions. That is like a lifeline for all countries and all societies in the, in the future. That's why when governments are making plans how to spend money in order to get recovery from this virus and, and impacts of that. I think one area where investments are urgently needed is uh, digital infrastructure. Secondly, educational system. Uh, I'd like to stress the importance of uh, elementary education as well. Quite often when we speak about innovation, we are speaking about, uh, about the role of universities and uh, high-end educational entities. But the fact is that the basis for everything is elementary education. In our country, in Finland, it's free, free for all, and the quality of education is rather high. I think that is fundamental for, for Latin American countries as well. You have to be able to invest in elementary education. You need good teachers. You need good schools in order to guarantee that people have access to higher levels as well. Uh, third element is uh, regulatory environment. Uh, we have uh, two kinds of schools. In, in the US, there are a lot of uh, businesses, even politicians, who are saying that governmental regulation is not needed. It's dangerous for innovation. Uh, then we have uh, countries in the world who completely rely on governmental funding, governmental interventions, government's role. And uh, I don't believe that these extremes are right kind of models for countries like Finland and, and Chile. We have to be able to, to, to understand that certain level of regulation is required in order to get good results. I'd like to call it smart regulation, not too heavy, but uh, rules have to be approved and they have to be similar for all, guaranteeing equal playing field for, for all. Access to the market is critical for innovation and you can guarantee that in the best way if the regulatory environment is, is proper. So, so you have to do investments in that but you have to be very, very cautious because there always there is a risk of over-regulating, which means that it's killing, killing innovation capacity. For the fourth, public and private, or actually public-private people collaboration is critical for innovation. Let's take an example from logistics and transportation. If you want to have a well-functioning transportation system, you need all these three elements. You need uh, governments who are making these basic investments or at least design of the uh, logistical and infrastructure system. You need private companies to provide solutions, services in that area. But you need also clever people, clients and customers of, of uh, companies 
who are able to take benefit from, from those, uh, those investments made. That's why collaboration is very critical. We have to be able to collaborate and to have very clear division of labor, especially between business and government. So that government is creating guidance, creating design of the system, and then the private sector is taking care of the operational part of the, of the business. There are many other uh, aspects, but I'd like to conclude by taking a couple of, uh, couple of not that often uh, mentioned criteria of uh, ecosystem. And one of them is leadership, leadership uh, requirement. All the democratic countries are now in, in challenge, facing challenges. Leadership requirements have changed rapidly. And there are a lot of countries where democracies are in, not in crisis, but, but at least in facing major challenges. How to create long-term commitments, how to get strategic leadership, that is extremely critical. And uh, I believe that democratic societies will survive and democracies are the best to compete in, in, in or they have capacities to compete with others in, in this area. But we have to accept the fact that democracies have to be, to be de developed and democratic systems have to be developed. Most critical thing is trust. We have to be able to create trust among citizens because trust is guaranteeing that systems we will be able to create will, will get support needed. When the level of trust is low, it's very difficult to create innovative society and to take maximum out of technologies available. And finally, you need patience. Uh, both in the business and government, the problem is that we want to get everything today. People do not understand that in order to get something fundamental to be done, you urgently need time. Companies, they have to report annual results, quarterly results. Uh, it's very difficult to, to motivate owners of companies to invest in something which will be paid back in five years later or 10 years later. That kind of investments are difficult to be, to be adopted and approved by, by companies. In the same way, in politics, elections are coming and politicians do not have enough capacity to make investments which are paying back later on, after their period in politics will be over. But we actually need that kind of investments. Let's take an example, education. If we want to get the educational system to, to work properly and to get good results uh, later on, uh, one year, two years plans are not sufficient. You need to have five years, 10 years programs in order to improve the level of, level of educational, uh, the quality of educational uh, systems. Ladies and gentlemen, these are my, my uh, observations. Uh, my final comment is that uh, Chile and uh, Finland are quite far away from each other. So we are quite different countries having different kind of histories. But, but I think that in the, in the field of uh, innovation, in the field of uh, technological uh, sector performance, we face rather similar challenges. We are traditionally, or we have traditionally been raw material based societies, uh, rather poor economies as, as well. But we have seen that, uh, that when doing right kind of things, right kind of investments, you can, you can get uh, uh, results, you can, you can achieve uh, both economic and uh, social and, uh, and cultural success. Uh, I really hope that uh, these ideas I have presented here will assist you to analyze what your country should do in order to, to gain 
from science, technology and innovation because uh, that is the biggest asset we have. And uh, I think you, you should be able to get people to concentrate into the next big thing, not to look back what has happened in history or what is available today, but to, to understand that the next big things will happen and you should be part of that. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, ESCO. Excelente presentación y sus propuestas muy valiosas para nuestro país. Los cinco criterios para casos ex exitosos de Gladwell son realmente muy buenos lineamientos a seguir y lo, lo seguiremos y ve veremos eso. Ahora, dentro de estos, probablemente el asumir riesgos es uno de los más difíciles. Pero como bien usted dice, si no asumimos riesgos altos, eh, las retribuciones tampoco pueden ser tan altas. Otro aspecto que me gustaría comentar de su exposición respecto a la experiencia de Finlandia es que su país aumentó el gasto en I más D más I en los años 80 y que fue una política de Estado. Es decir, políticos de distintos sectores se pusieron de acuerdo en este aspecto y lo asumieron y siguieron este, este marco y más que un gasto fue considerado una inversión. Creo que ese cambio también es algo muy sustantivo y muy interesante y que nosotros podríamos seguir. Quiero comentar a nuestra audiencia que tanto en el proceso de inscripción de este seminario como hoy, a través de las plataformas en las que estamos transmitiendo, hemos recibido una gran cantidad de comentarios y preguntas dirigidas a ESCO. Su exposición ha generado un gran interés. Son hartas consultas, no las podemos hacer todas y por ello las hemos agrupado y solamente vamos a hacer algunas que son las que hemos seleccionado para usted ESCO. Nuestro invitado está recibiendo la señal en su idioma y por eso voy a formular la pregunta en español. Y la primera pregunta para ESCO es ¿Chile es un país donde el gasto en investigación y desarrollo no supera el 0,35% del PIB, en comparación con Finlandia, que es superior al 2,5%? Dado esto, ¿qué recomendaciones nos puede entregar para lograr aumentar la inversión estatal y privada en I más D más I? In the case of Finland, uh, this uh, decision made around 1980 to double our R&D investment, it was uh, extremely critical for future success story of Finland. You cannot explain why our uh, economy was uh, diversified in a way it did. You cannot explain how it was growing so fast, like it did, why Nokia was, uh, was uh, having great success story uh, in Finland. You cannot understand that without taking into the consideration massive investment in R&D. And by the way, we faced a major, luckily rather short economic crisis early 1990s, It was uh, partly because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, but partly also because of our own internal mistakes made. Uh, and even during that period of time, when our economy contracted with uh, more than 10%, actually 12% between 1990 and 1993, we doubled our investment in R&D. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. GDP declined by 12% in three years, but we doubled our R&D spending, government, or the whole R&D spending, not only the government part of that. And uh, I think it was extremely important investment for the, for the future. Secondly, how to do that? I think your level is absolutely too low. You have to be able to get that higher. Again, you cannot do that overnight. It will take, you have to have, 10 years plan or 10 years program for that and at least 10 years program for that but in order to do that you have two ways to do and to go one quite often used is uh, based on tax incentives so that 
in order to get companies to invest, government is providing for them tax incentives. We did not use that method in Finland. We matched private investment. If uh, a company was a, uh, interested to put 100 into certain R&D project, government funding agency put another 100. So the, 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 the sector or the area where investment was made was selected by the company, but government supported that knowing that company was taking enough risk in that area. Why uh, this is better than, than uh, tax incentives? I think tax incentives are uh, always quite a complicated method because you don't know exactly how the money is going to spend and you cannot be sure that everything is going to, to serve uh, innovative purposes. So matching private investment, in my opinion, is the best way to do that. And my recommendation is that please set a long-term target. Don't try to get from 0 0.35 to 1% in two years or three years. You, you need a long-term plan, uh, uh, including some, some uh, steps to be taken so that you, 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 you have to you have to be able to have a patient, long-term plan to, to get a level of R&D spending. Let's say level of 1.52% is something you should absolutely uh, reach. Comparto con usted, ESCO, que la inversión en nuestro país es baja, ¿verdad? Y que debe incrementarse. Ojalá, tal cual como usted nos comentaba, que lo hizo Finlandia, incluso en momentos en que la economía decaía. Es importante su experiencia y este aporte. Y ojalá muchas autoridades lo estén escuchando. Antes de pasar a la segunda pregunta, quiero agradecer a los miles de seguidores en las redes sociales que realmente nos están mandando muchas más preguntas. Realmente ha despertado mucho su interés, mucho interés esta exposición eh, en nuestros seguidores. Y la segunda pregunta para ESCO es la siguiente. ¿Qué modelos o estrategias de colaboración entre el Estado, el sector privado y la academia han sido exitosos en Finlandia que podrían ser adaptados en Chile con miras a incrementar nuestras capacidades de innovación y con ello, por ejemplo, aumentar el valor agregado de nuestras exportaciones que siguen siendo principalmente materias primas? For the first, I think it's very important to understand that when, when we industrialized, we didn't leave traditional agricultural production. And when we are moving to digital society, we don't leave industrial production. But the industrial production will be changed as well. So digitalization doesn't mean creation of new economy but uh, improving the existing economy in a massive way by taking benefit from technologies. That is something we have to understand. So existing companies are extremely important for digital future of the country. So you don't need to establish new companies. That is necessary as well, but, but that, is, that, is, that is not the only way to get uh, digitalization to happen. But even more important probably is that the old existing companies will be changed and society as a whole will be able to take benefit from, from uh, digitalization. And uh, secondly, when creating practical models, our experience is uh, strongly in favor of uh, collaboration between companies and uh, academic institutions institutions and research centers. It's very important that there is going to be going to be very tight collaboration between these two. Sometimes universities are quite hesitant. They feel that they want to be independent and uh, and uh, collaboration with between uh, universities and companies will will uh, mean that they will lose certain part of that independence. I 
completely disagree. I think it's uh, also good for universities that they will have collaboration with the companies because that means that they will be more relevant. And relevance is important for academic institutions as well. It's not uh, uh, important to make uh, research for research sake, but to, to create relevant information, relevant material for decision makers in the country, both on the private and public sector. And that's why collaboration is so, so critical. And Finland became early 1990s and in the middle of 1990s, Finland became maybe the best country in the world in business and academia collaboration. Don't hesitate to follow that path. Nos llega fuerte y claro a los investigadores su última respuesta, ESCO. No investigar por investigar y investigar de manera aplicada y de manera de que podamos dar respuestas a problemas y dar soluciones reales. Eso es tremendamente importante. Se agradece la franqueza y nos van a quedar muchas preguntas, pero tenemos que seguir avanzando. Por razones de tiempo voy a hacer solamente una última. Debido a algunas similitudes entre Chile y Finlandia, es común que señalemos a su país como un ejemplo para avanzar hacia el desarrollo. Ante esto, ¿qué espacios de colaboración entre Chile y Finlandia, en su opinión, podrían potenciarse y así lograr beneficios mutuos? For the first, it's not very easy to to take uh, examples and experiences from other countries and to move them to different continents. Uh, I don't believe that that is the right method. But, uh, but the right method is to, to learn to know good cases, successful cases, because uh, you can learn from those successful cases and to to apply them in your own way, in your own circumstances. I think we have learned one lesson uh, thanks to financial crisis and this pandemic, that uh, for the leadership training, it's more important to, to learn from success stories and to have uh, uh, worst case scenarios in the, for the future than to create uh, fantastic plans for the future and to try to learn from mistakes made in the history. I think this uh, first method is better, to learn from success stories and to be prepared for worst case scenarios. That's uh, what good business leaders and national leaders should do, at least in these circumstances. When looking at economies and societies, I think there are some similarities between Finland and, uh, and, and Chile. Uh, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, we are dependent on raw materials, uh, paper and pulp industry and the forest industry uh, and metal industry based on, on forestry and forest industry has been foundation for the success story of Finland and Finnish industrialization. And, uh, and, uh, similar case in uh, in uh, Chile as well. I think uh, these sectors have to be changed as well. Forest industry has huge potential now. We have seen transformation of that sector thanks to digitalization. Use of uh, paper products has declined. But in the same time, packaging materials are, are needed. Construction materials based on wooden products uh, is, is getting more and more important. And uh, think about textiles. Cotton is, is uh, from environmental perspective, rather complicated product. It requires a lot of water. It requires uh, use of pesticides. It's, it's not at all environmental friendly product. But uh, technologies will be there. They are partly already there. 
which will make it possible that wooden materials, wooden fiber, will be used instead of cotton. And this is a good example what kind of potential uh, forestry and forest industry will have in the future. The same with chemical, chemical aspects as well. I think that we can learn from each other uh, in, in these areas. Circular bioeconomy will be one area where I hope that Finland and Chile will, will work together. Ojalá ESCO, Finlandia y Chile puedan trabajar juntos en muchas áreas y como usted dice, debemos aprender de los casos de éxito. Reiteramos los agradecimientos al ex primer ministro de Finlandia, ESCO Ajo, por haber participado en nuestro seminario internacional y por su excelente exposición, lo que se reflejó en la cantidad de comentarios que ustedes enviaron. Es la primera vez que tenemos a un ex jefe de Estado exponiendo en nuestro seminario, Ha sido un orgullo realmente poder presentarlo en Chile en este seminario de la Fundación COPEC-UCED.